Uh, everybody on Zoom, hello. Glad to have you join us this evening. Um, I tend to move around a lot, so I'm really grateful to the tech crew for allowing me to, to present in person and also to, um, to share this information on Zoom. So the first time I was here was 2011. Uh, the next time was 2016, then 2019. Anybody come to any of those previous programs? Okay. And here I am again, because you know what? This is an ongoing challenge. I will tell you that my uh, focus has changed over the years. When I started, I was wildly optimistic, and now I'm much more pragmatic about what we can and can't do with our invasive plants. I will tell you, as a, I have a little bias toward the Native Plant Society groups, because you all already get it. You know that if we have native plants, then we have food. If we have invasive plants, we don't have the food. So that's a main focus um, of mine these days that didn't used to be. I used to just want you to know what they look like so you could remove them from your yards. But now I really focus on how they cause harm. Harm to human health, harm to the environment, and so forth. So let's go jump in here. Again, I'll get this. OK, on a global basis, our, our famous E.O. Wilson uh, said, the two great destroyers of biodiversity are first, habitat destruction, and second, invasion by exotic species. He has passed now, but brilliant man. There are many ways to destroy habitat and reduce biodiversity. We know, we know about these. We know many of these. Habitat destruction by urban sprawl. Bear County, since I moved there in 1989, has doubled in population. I think that's pretty much holding true for most of the Hill Country area. Habitat destruction by urbanization. Um, this actually is a picture of China, where there are 30 cities over 10 million people. How does anything grow in an environment like this? Habitat destruction by overgrazing. We have a long tradition of ranching in, in Texas. Um, some extraordinary ranchers out there and, and some folks that, to put food on the table, have been forced to, into an overgrazing situation. We also have habitat destruction by agriculture monoculture. I'm from the Midwest, so I know these, these combines. I know the way that they raise corn, soy, wheat. Last but not least, habitat destruction by a traditional lawn. I would guess that most of us here now have moved from the traditional lawn to something um, that's, that's um, more palatable to our wildlife. I will tell you that's what my lawn looked like in 1978. So I've been there, done that. Did the chem lawn, did the, you know, the weed, uh, killed every weed, killed every insect, killed every living thing, um, and watered the heck out of it. But I've, I've, I've seen the light, and <laughs> as many of you have. But in fact, we have a monoculture, I think, probably still, in most um, regions of the country, we have about 80% of, of homeowners have a traditional American lawn. Okay, we know habitat destruction by invasive plants, which is the focus of my program. How many of you know kudzu, the vine that ate the south? Okay. <laughs> English ivy is the vine that's eating the north, right? I spent a fortune on an Ivy League college for my son, and then I went up and saw all those buildings with all that ivy and um, wanted to pull it down, you know, piece by piece. Um, we know that there is an official definition of invasive species. It's defined as a species that is non-native to the ecosystem and whose introduction causes or is likely to cause economic or environmental harm or harm to human health. Now, often in these programs, people will say, well, I have this plant in my yard. It's native, but it's invasive. That's a different issue. Um, this definition is the one that was adopted. It's, it's a national definition. This is the definition that we use. If the plant is non-native and causes economic or environmental harm or harm to human health. <coughs> How bad is it? 50,000 species of plants have been introduced in the U.S., starting with uh, Thomas Jefferson, who wanted to have plants from all over the world. About 5,000 introduced plants have escaped cultivation into the wild. And 42% of endangered or threatened species are at risk from invasive species. Now, some of you are going down to the botanic gardens. You're also going to be talking about some of the rare plants with Michael uh, Eason. And you know, a lot of those rare plants are highly vulnerable at this moment to the invasive species that are crowding them out. 
Invasive plant infestations in the U.S. equal an area the size of Texas, and it's probably an underestimate. Picture every square inch of Texas covered with invasive plants. That's just in the U.S. It costs the U.S. economy $135 billion annually, and I guarantee you that does not include all of the volunteers that are in the parks, preserves, and in our backyards removing the invasives. So it's a huge economic issue. There's a, um, there's a brochure uh, at the back. I hope you all take one. Hello, Invasive Species, Goodbye Texas. It's the texasinvasives.org, and they basically represent a multiplicity of organizations that are working on invasive species in the state of Texas. Also has a fantastic database. So if you have something in your yard you're not sure what it is, um, you can go to the database and it has pictures much the same way as the Lady Bird Johnson Native Plant, um, uh, Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center has native plant database. Okay, what makes a native plant invasive? Rapid vegetative growth. We're going to talk about uh, giant reed. Arundo Donax, some, somebody mentioned they saw some in a ditch on the way here. It's all through Texas and we'll talk a little bit more about it. It can go 10 inches a day, 10 inches a day, rapid vegetative growth. Johnson grass, raise your hand if you know Johnson grass. We tried to find, we tried, we tried to find one on the way here today, but we were moving too fast on the highway. But the bottom line is Johnson grass has those rhizomes, runners, and stems 200 feet from the mother plant. Two-thirds of the length of a football field, if you've got a Johnson grass plant right here, it's sending rhizomes up to 200 feet. So that's why, you know, when you, I do try to pull them up in my yard. They, they tend to be a little more manageable there than they are in a ranch or a large property. Try to pull them up when the soil is damp, but you're still not going to get all those rhizomes. You're going to have to do it over and over and over again. What makes a plant invasive? A lot of them release allelopathic chemicals that inhibit, inhibit germination, growth, survival, and reproduction of other plants. Chinese tallow tree is a classic. Basically anything that um, tries to grow under a Chinese tall tallow tree is killed by the chemicals that the plant exudes. Tree of Heaven also has extraordinarily toxic um, chemicals in the, in the leaves, the roots, and um, basically all, all parts of the plant. We know that uh, another problem is that many of these have abundant seed production. We're not going to talk about lilac chase tree here today, Texas lilac, but if you see one in the, in the uh, nursery, please do not buy it. 40,000 seeds per pound, 325,000 per year on a lilac chase tree. We're talking about an understory shrub. There is no such thing as a Texas lilac. So please do not buy lilac chase tree. We'll talk a little bit more about that. And the other one we mentioned is um, golden rain tree. Let's go back. Sorry. Let's see. It doesn't seem to be working. The opposite, when you, the opposite side should work. It was working earlier. Oh, there we go. Okay. Oh, yeah. Golden rain tree is another one that has extraordinarily fast germination rate. So that seed hits the ground six days later, you've got a plant. Okay, why do plants become invasive? Favorable environmental conditions, such as disturbed sites, they're the first thing that's going to come up after the bulldozers go through, and floods. What do they call Central Texas? Flash Flood Alley. We have more flash floods here than almost any place else in the world. Some of, I think I read somewhere that three of the top ten flash flood events in the world happen in, in Central Texas. So we've got a big issue. Every time we have a flood, um, we have invasive plant seeds heading downstream. A lack of natural controls. So this is huge because we talk about food, right? The native plants provide food. The invasive plants, nothing eats them or hardly anything eats them. The parasites, the herbivores, the diseases have not yet discovered that plant that came from Asia or from the Mediterranean or from South Africa. A lack of competitors that normally regulate their population. How many of you have had an experience where you've planted a beautiful native plant, you go out the next day, and it's bare, right? Something has eaten the entire thing. Anybody had that experience? Oh, yeah. Okay, so that's the good news. Now, what I learned the hard way is I thought, well, it's dead, and I tossed it, and I realized it will come back. <laughs> but we have, to, we have to allow our creatures to eat our plants because that's how they survive. 
How many of you have seen the giant reef along the Rio Grande River? Okay, we're talking four to five hundred miles of Arundo Donex giant reef along the Rio Grande River. And what happens with that is that because of the nature of, of Arundo Donex, um, it alters the hydrologic flow, the fire patterns, the soil characteristics, and the nutrients. So it basically destroys the riparian habitat. Now we see Arundo Donex at every ditch between here and Houston. Uh, we see Arundo Donex in a lot of the Hill Country Creeks now. It's pretty much taking over Texas. And someone mentioned that there's some not too far from here, and wouldn't that be a great project? And I'm happy to talk with you about that. We've done a lot of Arundo removal. But when you're looking at a, a scale like this, you basically require huge amounts of uh, resources. How many of you know Ligustrum? <laughs> okay, yes. it creates a monoculture. Again, it creates a, a canopy, shade canopy, where nothing can grow underneath it. There's the giant reed I was talking about. This is not grass, folks. This is miles and miles and miles of, of 20 foot tall reeds. That's what it looks like when, when a plant like this forms a monoculture. Are they doing anything to try to tackle that? Uh, they are. There are a couple of things they're trying to do uh, with the rondo. One is a uh, biological control, and they also do a lot of, um, they try burning it, and they also um, <coughs> use chemicals. Okay, we know that invasive plants cause harm because they reduce biodiversity. They also, many people don't know this, that a lot of these plants are toxic to livestock, domestic animals, wildlife, and humans. We'll talk a little bit more about um, some of the plants that are the most problematic. Uh, let's go back to this one. So my assistant, Missy, is going to walk around with some uh, products that I brought today. Very uh, beautiful. There's a bowl of, of fruit, and there's also a wonderful plant. Um, and you'll see that they're gorgeous, but they're plastic. <laughs> And so the reason I usually use this, these samples with young children because it helps them understand the concept that if you have a pretty plant but it's not native, then nothing can eat it. And so I try to use the analogy that it may as well be, if that plant is in your yard, that ligustum or that Chinese towel or that china berry, it may as well be a plastic plant. It looks good. It does look good, doesn't it? Also, a lot of these, a lot of the seeds, uh, berries, drips, and so forth, and these plants are actually toxic to wildlife. And I've, I've, the more you understand about these plants, the more you realize that they're that they have a dark side. Okay, how did they arrive? On purpose or good intentions with unforeseen consequences uh, by the horticulture industry for ornamental purposes by government agencies for flood and erosion, that's how Arundo came into being, wind barriers, livestock grazing. Who can tell me the one that was brought in for livestock grazing, the big one? K.R. K.R. Bluestone, that's one of many. When, when we were in West Texas, where the state NIPSOC conference, there are probably 30 different invasive grasses out there that have been introduced and basically have, have run amok. So the native grasses are struggling to keep up. How did they arrive? So we know that a lot of times they come with contaminated seed mixes or hay, uh, tech stock early on. I understand they've changed this procedure, but tech stock early on was basically introducing KR and then mowing and then introducing. And so every time the mower went to a new area, uh, it was introducing the invasive grasses. I asked one of the tech stock people this year mm -hmm. about that. He said tech stock itself does it when they hire these contractors. Yes. It's, it's, they, pay less for it, and so they go with KR. You're exactly right. And, and there, there are um, ag, ag extension people who spend their entire um, working career trying to get the right mixes and keep the invaders out, and it's almost impossible. Yeah. Um, also, we're responsible. If anybody goes hiking, I mean, today I was at Medina River National Area. My boots came back with about an inch worth of, of mud and clay and seeds. So I'm not wearing those boots again until I have a chance to get all the gunk out because I don't want to inadvertently take the gunk from the Medina River uh, natural area up to one of the northern parks in San Antonio. So it's important for us to do that. The same with, you know, taking the, anybody have beggars, beggars ticks or, or uh, bed straw cleavers? I mean, same thing, right? You don't want to carry those to the what next. What do you do with the stuff that you remove? I put it in the trash. I put it in my, so in, I have, I don't put it in the compost. <laughs> I put it in basically in the trash. 
We know that there's a lot of flood events. We talked about that. Um, a lot of the aquatics came from uh, release from aquariums. On the way in today on, on uh, 46 or whichever one, a big sign, clean, drain, and dry. Okay, that's for zebra mussels, but it's also for aquatic invasive plants. If you don't clean, clean drain, and dry your trailer, your boat, etc., then you're carrying that invasive to the next lake or river. We also know that birds, animals, and humans disperse the seeds. Okay, they've also escaped. When you go down to the botanic gardens, they still have some invasive plants there. And um, a lot of those plants are there as a demonstration, but I still struggle with that because that Chinese tallow is still going to release seeds. Um, and those ligustrums are still going to release seeds. So if you're involved in a park preserve or whatever, do your, do your darndest to convince the folks to get those out of there because they I do escape cultivation. I have those. And you have bamboo. A constant fight. So, um, and they'll come up 30 feet away from the rest of them. So, so this unfortunate woman has bamboo. Um, <laughs> bamboo. And we had the same situation in our yard. It took us about eight years to get rid of it. We can talk about it afterward. Um, but it's a huge issue. You yeah. started a chopstick company. <laughs> Get some Get a <laughs> Start a chopstick company. Yeah. So um, everybody maybe should have picked up one of these. If not, maybe someone can help pass these around. We're going to talk about these 12. Uh, the Texas uh, Invasives.org has 144 invasive plants, but these are the 12 that they identify as the most problematic for this region. Missy, uh, my assistant, is also going to bring around the plant just in case you haven't seen it or don't recognize it. So I have plant samples for some, but not all of these plants. Okay, we are category number seven, which is um, Edwards Plateau, except for if anybody lives closer to 35 New Braunfels, you've got a little bit of the Black Lake Prairie there, um, that, that thin little, as we know, that thin little strip here, right? So basically, we're right in here. The bulk of what we're dealing with is Edwards Plateau, which is why we chose this set of plants. Okay, the first one is Ligustrum. There are five species of Ligustrum in Texas. There's no such thing as a good ligustrum. None of the ligustrums have any redeeming value. They form a canopy that shades everything else out. They have multiple branches that are difficult, it's like Medusa's heads, hard to control it. Um, they colonize by root sprouts and spread by animal and bird dispensed seeds. The chemicals uh, prohibit ingestion, digestion for insects, and they're extremely fast growing, which is why they're still being promoted by the nursery industry. If somebody wants a screen, they're going to buy a ligustrum because that plant's going to form a, uh, basically a screen within three to five years. For as regarding human health, the pollen of ligustrum exacerbates allergies and, and asthma in both pets and humans. If you ingest the berries, it can cause abdominal distress, and the contact with berries or leaves can cause dermatitis or eye irritation. So those are three of the ways that ligustrum is harmful to human health. Uh, the next one, I'm sorry, one more piece of that. So we learned this the hard way with the Bastrop fires. So there were a variety of ligustrum thickets in the Bastrop area when the pine trees uh, caught on fire. And what we've discovered is if you have uh, an understory, for example, of ligustrum invasive plant that is, has overgrown, then it creates what they call a crown fire. <clears throat> which is the hottest, um, most difficult fire to put out. So what happened in Bastrop and many other wildfires in Texas is you have an understory like Ligustrum that basically creates ladder fuels and you, to, the, to have the hottest, most intense crown fires. Um, most people don't know that Texas is second in the country with wildfires, with the amount of acreage that is um, destroyed every year by wildfire. So it is an issue, and ligustrum is one of the culprits. Chinese tallow. How many of you know tallow? It's not as pervasive here as it is in the coastal plains, but it's still a big issue. Luckily, the sample I have right here has some of the little popcorn seeds still on it, <clears throat> and it also has the new growth. OK, there's no such thing as a good tallow. The good news is that it's, it's on the um, prohibited list. Nurseries can no longer sell Chinese tallow in the state of Texas. <clears throat> 100,000 seeds per year for up to 100 years. 
projected to expand northward. So Austin, uh, Texas just did a survey of risk factors as the climate is shifting and changing, and they basically said invasives are going to take over even more, but particularly uh, plants like Chinese tallow are going to move. Can you take those lights down? Going to move west Great. and north. So we're more likely to see some of the tallows up here uh, than we have in the past. <laughs> Tallows account for 33% of trees in the Houston area, area, excuse me, Houston area public spaces with an annual increase of 38%. <clears throat> here's, the, here's the problem. Back in 2011, before we had Harvey and before we had tropical storms, the huge tropical storms, it was like one out of every five tree was a tallow. Each time we had a major flood event, then it became one out of four. Now it's one out of three because they can, the roots can sustain long periods of wet feet, basically, including saltwater intrusion. So let me show you the chart <clears throat> that shows what's happening with Chinese tallow in the past 20 years. So you better believe the foresters are concerned because it's taking over the traditional hardwoods of the coastal plain. Johnson grass. You all know Johnson grass. I don't have an example, but we've got a couple handouts. <clears throat> it is, um, has extremely high seed production, can cause allergens, it spreads aggressively by those rhizomes that I indicated go 200 feet. How many of you have heard of the prussic acid? Okay, so anybody who's a farmer or rancher, you need to know this because under certain cir circumstances, <clears throat> Johnson grass can produce prussic acid, which will kill your sheep, goats, horses, and cattle. Now, it's a unique situation of drought versus freeze <clears throat> versus new growth, but it's something you need to be aware of if you have Johnson grass on your property. The seeds are viable in the soil for up to 20 years. It forms dense stands, increased fire risk, listed in the top 10 most invasive plants in the world. It's a bad, bad, bad actor. And the pollen, as I said, is a known allergen. Okay, Nandina. How many of you know Nandina? So it's a little controversial because, of course, it's a very beautiful plant, particularly the red berries. But we've learned a lot about Nandina in the past um, few years. We know that it colonizes by spreading vegetatively through underground root sprouts. So even if you pull it up, you've got to get all the roots or it will grow again. It escapes cultivation, <clears throat> displaces the native species, <clears throat> but here's the worst part. The berries contain cyanide. So, they're toxic to cats, dogs, grazing animals, children, and birds. This is pretty graphic. This is what happened. This is how they discovered it. They had a die-off of cedar wax wings in Georgia <clears throat> back in 2008. When they did the uh, ne necropsy, they discovered that their gullets were filled with um, Nandina berries, which caused them to hemorrhage to death. The same thing happens if a small child eats a Nandina berry, they don't hemorrhage to death because it's one berry and the child is much bigger, but they become extremely ill. <clears throat> same thing happens with dogs, with cats, with any, anything that eats <clears throat> the Nandina. Excuse me. We've also learned a little bit about, yes, question. Why are uh, the big box stores still allowed to sell that, though? <clears throat> so the question is, why are the big box stores allowed to sell that? Because it's a, um, a very profitable plant. Well, how they get the tallow tree to not be? Uh, because there's a long process in the state of Texas. If you have a plant that you want to be on the, on the um, prohibited list, it has to go through several years of analysis <clears throat> so far. Nandina hasn't made it to the top, or, or the gustrum. <clears throat> so we've learned about the exponential function, and basically what happens is if you have one Nandina, it reproduces to the point where by year eight, you've got 4,000 Nandina plants. The same holds true with the invasion curve. <clears throat> so basically, when, when you identify an invasive plant, the first step is prevention. The next step is eradication, which our group called the Salsa Squad does a lot of that. The next step is containment, and the next one is <clears throat> we're out of control, so we're looking at long-term management. 
So <clears throat> I mentioned to you that when I first started, I kind of thought that we could take care of it here with eradication. And now I realize that we're really looking at long-term management with almost all of these plants. Okay, China berry tree, which is also on the list that you can no longer buy in a nursery. <clears throat> the barks, leaves, flowers, and fruit contain a neurotoxin that repels insects. So remember we talked about the food chain, right? If you have a plant that repels insects, then you're in big trouble with regard to um, providing food for insects. <clears throat> the mature fruits are poisonous to humans, dogs, cats, and livestock. Does anybody here have horses? Did you know that chinaberry was toxic to horses? No. Do you have a chinaberry in your yard? So I was at a dude ranch in Bandera, and in the middle of the pasture were a number of chinaberry trees. So I went to the ranch manager and I said, did you know that if your, one of your horses eats as few as eight china berries, it will kill it? <clears throat> so the next weekend, she was removing the china berry trees. Japanese honeysuckle, how many of you know this one? I thought that kudzu was the vine that was the most pervasive in the south. It's actually Japanese honeysuckle. And this is what it looks like, takes over an entire area, girdles and kills the trees <clears throat> as the vines thicken with age. It's the most common invasive vine in the south. And most, like, most commonly, it coexists with other invasive plants. Giant reed, this is the one we talked about. Who was it that mentioned that? Okay, you wanted to maybe tackle that. So what we do with giant reed is we cut it um, with loppers, and then we uh, spray it with a chemical, and then we do it again. Um, like um, Actually, we have to use one that works with uh, aquatic, um, that doesn't injure the aquatic area. Excuse me, the yes. giant reed, does it have purple flower? Is it also called the Joe Pye plant? No. No, yeah. that's different. It does have a, a, a tan inflorescence, Yeah, <clears throat> but that's that's in fact, you can kind of see the inflorescence. Which can be like two feet tall sometimes. <clears throat> yeah, sometimes the sometimes the inflorescence is two feet tall. But the seed is <clears throat> sterile. It is sterile. So here's how it reproduces. So basically, um, let's go to the next one. So what happens is the root and stem fragments float downstream. Any portion of that plant can form a new infestation. So what happens anytime there's a flood, whatever is uprooted, it just goes downstream. So we know that, let's go back, <clears throat> that the massive shallow roots cause bank erosion and damage to structures, grows 10 inches a day, can re-sprout from root fragments that are buried nine feet deep. And it crowds out the native plants. It does alter the water flow. It consumes 12 times as much water as the natives, and it's flammable. <clears throat> and then, of course, it goes down the street. Okay, golden rain tree. Anybody know golden rain tree? A little less common, but still problematic. This one has prolific seed production, and this is the one that can germinate in six to eight days. Beautiful. Um, I'll go back, go back again to the... <clears throat> you can see why it's popular. It looks like little Chinese lanterns. It's a beautiful tree, beautiful ornamental tree. Elephant ears. Seen those here? That's taro, T-A-R-O. Really? <clears throat> it is, but remember with taro, in other countries of the world, they boil it. You can't eat taro raw. And that's true with elephant ears as well. <clears throat> I've seen this in a variety of hill country streams. Once it takes hold, remember that the whole thing with the Arundo Donuts, if a piece of the elephant ear is pulled out during a flood, then it basically reestablishes a new colony downstream. Also, the liquid or oils from the leaf, stem, or roots can cause eye irritation, <clears throat> itching, and eye damage. All right, paper mulberry. How many of you know paper mulberry? Okay, another one, we have the red mulberry, which is our native Texas tree, and then we have a white mulberry, which is a non-native, so between the paper mulberry and the white mulberry, sometimes it's difficult to tell them apart. <coughs> the paper mulberry 
hybridizes, like we've said, and also um, forms dense thickets, aggressively grows, and the trees blow over easily due to shallow roots. Tree of Heaven. How many of you know Tree of Heaven? That's the tree grows in Brooklyn, you know, growing out of the sidewalk, that book you read when you were a small child. My main issue with the Tree of Heaven is that the sap can cause headaches, nausea, and heart issues. Mayo Clinic reports a, <clears throat> an arborist who had to be treated in the emergency room because he was having cardiovascular issues related on the, you know, basically <coughs> removing the Tree of Heaven. It also produces allelopathic chemicals that inhibit the germination of other native species, and its aggressive roots cause uh, underground a damage to underground pipes, sewers, and building foundations. Again, produces seeds by the time it's two to three years old. Lots of seeds germinate, maintain seed viability over its lifetime, and one mature tree can produce 325,000 seeds per year. KR Bluestem, I probably don't need to say too much about that except um, if you have it and you, it's in a small area, you can hand pull it. Otherwise, um, it requires a much <clears throat> more expansive approach. It does reduce the uh, diversity of insects, birds, and rodents. Um, if you have KR blue step in a ranching, grazing environment, there are some things you can do seasonally to make it less um, expansive, but it takes a lot of work. We know that it destroys the habitat of quail and other grassland birds. <clears throat> it's extremely <clears throat> difficult to eradicate, and it excludes other grass species. OK, we now know that climate change, more intense storms, uh, longer, more days over 100. We know that invasive species already have an advantage. At, in Austin, they're finding out that invasive species um, are causing, are basically out-competing are natives because the, as the climate changes, they have an unfair advantage. So if both climate change and invasive species threaten your park, your yard, your resource, it's probably most cost effective to try to reduce the invasive species. So if you've got a thousand bucks or 10,000 bucks and you have to apply it to something, start with the invasive species. <clears throat> this goes back to one of the other questions. We have these contradictions. We have invasive species that are being eradicated, and we have them for sale. And buffalo grass is a huge issue in West Texas. Let's go back here. We also know that um, there are lots of ways that these plants are still being promoted, including several of these that are in the Texas Superstar program. Um, but that's where you all come in, because if you make a decision not to buy them, <clears throat> then the nurseries will make better choices. So we can remove invasive plants and replace them with native plants. <clears throat> Lots of different ways to kill these plants. Hand pulling, mulching, pruning, lopping, cut stem, girdling, and basal bark spray. Let's look at some pictures. Everybody knows hand pulling, right? <laughs> right, now, right now it's bastard cabbage, right? Do you all have bastard cabbage? <clears throat> there we are. Uh, I'd like to say that was today, but it's every spring. So every year we're doing that. We also have things like the weed wrench. Anybody ever used a weed wrench? Okay, it's very, very, um, uh, it's, it's a fantastic strategy for plants that have a relatively small diameter. So I, I like to use it anywhere from two to five inches. Any bigger than that, it gets, it's too hard. Don't forget your assistive devices. Always helpful to have that. <clears throat> We use um, pruners, loppers, DeWalt reciprocating saws, and if you have a, a chainsaw, of course, that works too. This is cutting and spraying the giant reed. You mentioned wanting to do that, so we had loppers. We would cut and spray immediately, <clears throat> and then again and again and again. In this case, you don't leave it there because what happens if you leave it? It goes downstream in the next flood. So we basically pulled it up to the top of the hill, <clears throat> put it in the back, mulched it, and then they burn the mulch. Also, elephant ears. Uh, we did elephant ears and giant reed in that particular creek. creek. You can see he's got a, a, a big uh, hand of elephant ears. This is cutting and spraying mandina. 
uh, in this particular Nandina forest. Lonnie uh, Shockley is six foot four, and the Nandina was about a foot taller than he was. And this Nandina forest was a monoculture of about seven acres. We sometimes girdle trees, particularly if we can be in an area where no one's going to be, there's no liability issue, because you don't want to girdle a tree that's going to fall on a car, a house, or a person. Apparently for Ligostrum, you have to do bigger than that. You have to girdle more. Well, the problem with Ligostrum is you've got multiple, right. you've got multiple branches. Right. <clears throat> we don't actually girdle Ligostrum. We, we, cut, we cut stem with, with a Ligostrum. We girdle Chinaberry trees and, and Chinese towel trees. <clears throat> because they're typically, you know, some of them are six, eight feet in diameter. Uh, there's, there's a chinaberry tree. There's another chinaberry tree. Basal bark spraying is also an effective way if you've got a lot of money. Because it caught, you basically are spraying up to about 18 inches the base of the tree. And that can work without girdling, without cutting. Again, it has to be in an environment where that tree can die and not have a liability issue. Okay, so remember we talked about an invasive species can cause or is likely to cause economic or environmental damage or harm human health. So how can we help? You're all here and you're native plant folks. We know that if we choose native plants, that's a huge answer. Native plants provide nectar, pollen, seeds, berries, food for larvae, attract a greater variety of insects. How many of you know Doug Ptolemy, bringing nature home? Nature's best hope. So you know what, Doug Ptolemy changed my whole perspective. When I first started doing these workshops, my main goal was talking about what, how to identify the plant. After I read Ptolemy, I got it. It's about the food, folks. If we don't have the native plants, then we don't have the biodiversity in the ecosystem because the insects are the base of the food chain. Cheryl? Yes, sir. Question, question in chat. What yeah. herbicide do you use for cut spray control? Um, so the answer to that is pretty complicated. Basically, we work under the auspices of a licensed applicator, and that person chooses whichever herbicide is appropriate for that habitat. So we use a different herbicide for every kind of tree and for every kind of habitat. Uh, we know that Doug Ptolemy discovered that oak trees support 534 species of Lepidoptera alone. We know that China green <coughs> trees are toxic to insects. We also know, most of you know, that 96% of bird species in North America rely on insects to feed their young. That includes the hummers. The hummingbirds feed their babies insects. So we can lead by example, remove them in our yard, and replace them with native plants. We can create habitats, which all of you are doing. We saw, there's a butterfly garden. The, the property here is amazing. I recently added the don't give up because we've been through what two, three, you know, two major freezes, lots of drought already. And the last four or five years have been brutal. Even my salvias bit the dust. But you know, my salvias were about 17 years old, so I mean, they, they hung, hung in there for a long time. But, but we don't give up because, you know, the natives are still going to have an advantage. They have figured it out over time too much heat, too much water, not enough water. So let's keep trying, don't, don't give up. Create a pocket prairie or wildfire flower garden as we see now everywhere, particularly the pollinators are in trouble. Share your knowledge with your neighbors and neighborhood associations. When I first put in, when I first removed all that grass in my yard, one of my neighbors came by, stopped his car and he got out and he said, what the hell are you doing? <laughs> okay, now my neighbors are the ones that are paying $400 a month to water their lawn in the summer, they're maybe shrinking the lawns a bit and they're, you know, making little areas around their trees. Eventually, people figure it out. And that's why we're here. We're here with our homeowners associations, with our outreach efforts to help people make the decisions that are right for nature and right for their pocketbook. This is the Salsa Squad. Maybe some of you have heard of us, maybe not. We wear these bright orange shirts. We got the name because one day we were out eradicating China, China berries, and there was an entire hillside with chili patine plants. And someone said, someone said, you know what? There's a, there are enough chilies here to make salsa for the whole squad. <laughs> so we're called the Salsa Squad. We wear the bright orange shirts every Tuesday morning for the last 15 years. 
our group goes out and eradicates a mix of plants or restores habitat. And this group varies, young and old. We have, we have teenagers, we have college age kids, we have, of course, a number of retirees. But this is a group that has staying power, and we all show up every Tuesday morning to make a difference. Doug Ptolemy says it will be the plants that we use in our gardens that determine what nature will look like in 10, 20, and 50 years from now. If you plant it, they will come. In the backyard, underneath my oak trees, um, the previous owner had planted monkey grass. And I pulled it up, planted Virginia creeper, which likes as both a ground cover and also goes up on the canopy. And sure enough, the eight spotted forester moth showed up. If you plant it, they will come. Margaret Mead says, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. I spent a little time when I first started up in Austin trying to make changes at the state level. And um, after a couple of years of headbanging, I decided to change my focus to this, to grassroots, to talking to each one of you and having you spread the word, one person to six people to 36 people. I've seen a huge difference in the last 15 years between not knowing anything about invasive plants, not knowing anything about native plants, to a full, we've really come, come a, a long, long way. It's because people like you are willing to make a difference to change the world. Cheryl, why generally did things at the state level not become effective? So the question is, why, wasn't, why couldn't we be effective at the state level? The answer is that the nursery industry in Texas is an $18 billion industry. And they are not going to stop selling Ligustum. They're not going to stop selling Nandina. They're not going to stop selling the invasive plants unless the state says they can't, which they do have a list of, you know, like China Berry and Tallow, or unless people stop buying them and start asking for native plants. I suspect that most of you buy your plants from the native plant nurseries, or you propagate them and you sell them yourselves. But the, 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 the usual American goes to the big box store, says, oh, this is pretty, and takes it home. Cheap. What's that? And cheap. Pretty and cheap, and they bring it home. Famous last words. <clears throat> but it's not invasive in my yard. <laughs> so I'll answer any questions from the chat or from the group. Um, your your links are in the chat. Oh, very good. You might tell them. Okay, sure. So, so what I have uh, there are a couple of links. The first link is to the invas Invaders of Texas site. Again, that's where you're going to find uh, all of the the 144 invasive plants that Texas has identified. <clears throat> the other two links are Jim, James Miller came up with a book called Invasive Plants in Southern Forests and Management Guide. So you had a question from somebody who wanted to know how to eradicate it. So this management guide tells you which herbicide for each plant. These are used to be available. I used to give them away and they stopped publishing them, but you can put it on an app, but you can also go online and download it as a PDF. And those are in the chat. So these are two very good, very good books if you're really wanting to dig into this. Yes, sir. So when I do my tobacco control lectures, I, I uh, discuss it and say, when your kids are upstairs in the bathtub and you see the water coming down the stairs, do you run upstairs and start mopping first or do you turn the water off first? And so, you know, I used to do a lot of work on invasives and, and go do that and I finally decided that the state of Texas doesn't care whatsoever and has a whole university over there in College Station developing all these invasive things from other parts of the world um, and they seem to have a lot more power than the biologists in their same university and their foresters in the same university who are having to deal with the invasives. Um, and so I fully, I fully understand <clears throat> that frustration. And what I've discovered is that for every person who's on the side of profit and promotion, there's also someone on the side of, of restoration and eradication. It, it doesn't feel like that sometimes, but I can't tell you how many hundreds of people yeah. I've met who are on the side of restoration and eradication. Yeah, but one of your coaches you used was from the UT biologist, not an Aggie biologist. <laughs> they don't give quotes like that. that. <laughs> they don't give quotes I'm like that. I'm married to an Aggie, okay? 
No, but I, I'm saying that all of these issues can, can be fraught with peril. Here's what I find. We roll up our sleeves, we have a good time in the field, we run, restore habitat, we create pollinator, um, pollinator gardens, we talk to people about our personal experiences with Arundo, with, with kudzu, with China berry, with Chinese tallow. We keep people from poisoning their horses or poisoning their toddlers. That's, that's my goal. So my goal is to share the information, ask that you stop the spread, spread the word, and you know what? It's happening. I see it happening. Because I've been doing this a long time. I yes, think it's interesting when you bring that up about um, the dollar you know, making the difference. And my family got all mad at me when I didn't vote one year. And I said, well, I'm not seeing much progress with my vote, but I'm seeing progress with my dollar. Like at HEB, Walmart, even places, good, for goodness sake, what is it called? Um, dollar General now has like organic stuff and all that a huge sections now actually walking through HEB, I was surprised how much they have. Yeah. Um, and I stopped buying it for a while. So. so I used to go into the nurseries and, and basically, you know, um, say, why are you selling this plant? And then I learned that that wasn't really very effective. So now I go to the nurseries and say, I have a list of 25 plants I'm looking for, and I'm wondering how many of these you can provide for me. And if, if they realize that they only, only have one, one on, item on the list, then, I mean, I've had, I've had entire um, nursery uh, land, you know, landscape workers in my sessions where they're all there taking notes on what plants people are wanting so they can go back and, and say, Let's ask our growers to grow these plants. So it's ha it is happening. It truly is. Any other questions from the chat? Okay. Yes, sir. Um, apparently, some cities have passed ordinances to not allow you to cut down um, juniper trees in the within the city limits. And last week at the filing deadline, six uh, representatives in our legislature. Um, put a bill in there to forbid cities from telling anybody what they could cut down. Mm -hmm. So that you can go cut down, you know, anything. You can cut down a native juniper and not do anything about this. So there's also, um, there, there is obviously conflict between yeah. <laughs> what happens in, in, in Austin and what happens in local um, jurisdictions. Yep. But again, Starting at the homeowners level, homeowner association level, starting at the city level, you know there are lots of cities now that have ordinances supporting wildlife gardens, pollinator gardens. Um, uh, I just worked with a, a, a group the other day, homeowners association. They wanted to cut all the understory plants and trees so that they could have a clear <clears throat> pathway, basically down to the riparian habitat, down to the creek. But you know what happened at Lego right a few years ago because all of those those uh, all of those uh, understory trees had been cut down. So when the Blanco River flooded, there was nothing to slow down that water. So we, we don't want homeowners associations to go right down to the edge of the riparian habitat because there's nothing then to hold the floodwaters or to slow down the floodwaters. Those are the kinds of things we can do, homeowners association by homeowners association. And whether it's invasive plants, whether it's native plants, whether it's riparian habitat, pollination, we've got a lot of work to do. But there are a lot of great folks who are doing it. And my, my, after all these years, my advice is to continue to, to join groups with a like-minded perspective. Because we can do it. And Doug Tallamy, you know, has homegrown National Park now, right? That's what he's working on. Where if we create habitats in our backyards, and if 120 million people do that, that's even that's way more effective than what we can do in our state and national parks. Okay, I, I'll wrap up. I know you all have to be out of here at a certain time. Thank you for being here, and also thank you on Zoom. And I hope that uh, you spread the word. Stop the spread and spread the word. Thank you. Thank you.